All right. So welcome to the Recovery Lab Podcast, Episode 1. Uh, y'all are going to have to bear with us because I'm not experienced in being a podcaster. My guests aren't experienced in being on a podcast. But we're going to work through this and it'll be fun and helpful. So I've got a few preliminary things to talk about. Uh, so my name's Drew Hassan. I live here in Jackson. I've been sober for five years. Uh, and I have uh, been... Uh, drugs and alcohol have been a problem for me pretty much my entire adult life. And with, you know, like everything else, it gets worse over time. I'm a recovering IV drug user. I've uh, injected just about everything you can from meth to crack to heroin to to lauded. So I found a way out and I thought that this podcast would be a good way to help others uh, find their own way out. So uh, I've got a little bit of homework for you, the listener. Uh, I want y'all to comment a lot, give constructive criticism, give suggested, suggested topics for future podcasts, recovery, steps, uh, psychological self-help themes, anything that you think might be interesting. I'm certainly down to hear it. Uh, message me on Messenger. You can text me. You can email me. Uh, my cell phone number is 601-297-3422. And my email address is andrewhassan at gmail.com. So I also want y'all to nominate other people to be on the podcast. Uh, it's only going to be with y'all's direct uh, involvement that we succeed in providing a comprehensive platform for recovery and can talk about some cool stuff. Uh, Also, if you know of anything that might be of some benefit to other people in recovery, post that. By way of example, I saw on Facebook the other day that the Pines, the treatment center for men in Columbus, is giving away Narcan, no questions asked. Uh, People need to know that. As an aside, uh, I think Mr. Moore, who has Moore's Bicycle Shop in Hattiesburg, who's an exceptional advocate for those in recovery, I think he also gives out Narcan. Okay, uh, if NPR and K-Love can do this, I guess I can have my own little begathon for a second. So, I don't want to make any money off this, but the whole podcast is not without some de minimis overhead. So if maybe you could find your way to donate a couple dollars here or there, it would certainly be of enormous benefit to me. Uh, The goal is to start like an LLC, get a tax ID number, and then offer up, you know, the transparency that should be there for any recovery-based charity of sorts. So if you're willing, I'll put my cash tag thing on the screen if I can pull that off. But it's cash tag Daniel Hassan. Okay, enough of the begging. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Luke Duncan and Johnny Jerfitz, my two friends. I love y'all both, and I appreciate your being here. Absolutely. Thanks, Drew. Glad to be here. Okay, so we were talking earlier about the general format, about how this is going to shake out. So because we're just kind of getting started and are new to this, it's generally going to be based around like what a speaker meeting would, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Uh, all right, so tell us a little bit about yourselves. How long have you been sober, where you live, what do you do, things like that. Uh, I'm Luke uh, D. I'm an alcoholic. I've been sober for four years. I live in Canton, Mississippi. Closer to the Gluckset side in Canton. Um, and I'm an elder me- mechanic, so uh, that's it. Actually. What goes up must come down. That's right. And uh, I'm Johnny Jerfitz. Uh, God willing, I make it three more weeks. I'll be sober five years. All right. Um, I just moved from Madison to the other side of the reservoir in Brandon. Um, Currently, I am uh, working as a business development representative for Banyan Treatment Center. We have 15 locations uh, across the country. I am the director for Linwood Sober Living, 
So all men sober living in Jackson, Flowood, and Hattiesburg. Um, I also do work with the Mississippi Public Health Institute uh, on a contract position uh, for the Department of Mental Health where I uh, do assessments on state facilities, uh, treatment centers uh, for dual diagnosis. And what, what kind of assessments? Dual diagnosis assessment. No, I mean, like, what do you do to make this assessment? Um, so we interview the uh, director, the clinical director, uh, therapist, peer support specialist, and um, some of the clients, and um, make sure they're focusing on mental health as well as substance abuse equally. All right, can you beat that? And I'm still the volunteer treasurer for the Oxford House Mississippi State Association. Well, look, I'm glad you brought up sober living houses because I know we all three have lived there, and I do want to talk more about that and how important that can be in helping a guy or girl maintain some sobriety and reintegrate into society. Okay, uh, we can start at the beginning. You can talk about your families of origin if you want or things from your past uh, not you know, trying to get all up in your business, but please do. All right, all right. Tell us how y'all's addictions began. Now that you can look back, y'all are about my age, around thirty-five to forty-five, and when you look back, where, where where did it start? It for me, it started when I was trying to solve all my problems by myself. Uh, I was very self-centered. I was very closed-minded. Uh, I wasn't um, willing to talk about. Uh, anything that was going on in my life, I would kind of bottle it up and just kind of bury it. And eventually those things kind of ate me away. Um, and I wanted to change the way I felt. And so I turned to other substances. And um, I did that for a long time. And it, it turned me into someone that uh, I'm not proud of whatsoever. Um, and it took me turning my will over to God to climb out of that. Uh, for years, I struggled without um, any knowledge of how to get out of that, that hole. And once I finally realized that, you know, I, I've got to ask for help. I've got to ask other people's opinions on, on how I can solve these issues. And um, that's what finally worked for me, is... Admitting that I didn't know everything. Well, let's circle back around to some of those later things that you said. What was the first drug you did? Or alcohol? What was the first thing? First thing I did was alcohol. I was actually on a Boy Scout camp out uh, back when I was uh, 14 or 15. And, uh, I did you took, get drunk? I took seven or eight shots of Jack Daniels. Threw up, didn't you? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And managed to beat up my, my friend. It, it was uh, not a pretty sight. Right, Luke, what about you? So for me, uh, I was always just the rebellious type. Um, anything against the grain, that was my uh, inherited traits from whom I don't know because I had, you know, well-to-do parents that raised me correctly. That's just the path that I chose. Uh, often feelings of social anxiety, you know, anxiety in general, anyway, to escape that. So mine looked more like uh, the occasional cigarette to, you know, neighborhood friends, parents having a Budweiser in the fridge. We would split it and, you know, have a round with that and then... The, the fifth of liquor after they went to sleep. So it kind of started there. And I thought early on, like, man, this, you know, this is how I want to feel. And I'm talking 12 or 13 years old, just didn't have to deal with what I was personally going on with at home. I didn't have a troubled life at home, like abuse, but I had a, Divorce that I took very personal when I was 10 turning 11 and I didn't know what to do with that pain so I turned to that so it very quickly progressed to marijuana you know I turned into a social butterfly when I was under the influence of a 
mood altering substance. So that was my comfort zone. Not only that, that was my prerequisite, if you will. Um, I got into a situation in the Ross Barnett Reservoir where I jumped off a boat under the influence to do a backflip and landed in short water with broken glass. Damn. And that cut my big toe basically off. It was still attached, but barely. And I still got a fat script of lower tabs at 18. And at that time, there wasn't this, uh, you know, all this stuff going on. And with the opiate crisis, they were flowing like 16 90 a month. Is it 18 years? Look, I got hurt playing football when I was in high school and uh, hurt my neck. <clears throat> and I could get, I mean, I remember the doctor came to my house a couple times, gave me a shot of Demerol, and I was like, man, that's where it's at. <laughs> that was good. Look, I think y'all both hit on something, though, like this, this sense of avoidance. Mm. You know, because I have seen how in my own life there are ways that I just want to avoid feeling things that are unpleasant. And I'll either like shut down and be, you know, paralyzed from fear, use drugs, although I don't really do that now. But I have to be on guard for new and inventive ways that my brain comes up with how I can avoid responsibility. And I think that's one of the chief things that being in AA or just in recovery in general can help with. Uh, okay, we crossed off the list here, how y'all's addictions began. When did it get worse for y'all? Well, when I was younger, I had uh, tried Oxycontin. There you uh, go. My, That'll do it. Bam! <laughs> my, my, my father uh, had diabetes and neuropathy. And one of my friends was over at the house and, and saw that he was prescribed Oxycontin and, and told me what it was. I had no clue. Little Johnny getting you hemmed up early, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah I tried it and... It was like a switch. Like, yeah. that was it. True. Now, my opiate addiction did not... Um, thrive. Thrive there, correct. Um, you know, I went through uh, years of alcoholism and um, staying up later, drinking, uh, using cocaine to stay up later. Uh, I had a... I was a, a manager at a at a sub shop in Startful, so I had to wake up early, and I was hungover, and I started taking Lord tabs then, and uh, you know those two three Lord tabs in the morning quickly turned into ten, and uh, once again a few years later I found oxycotton again, turned right back into it, um, and <clears throat> that really took off and. Uh, I discovered Dilaudid and eventually heroin, and um, it got real dark. Um, it was, it was like the absence of God in my life at the time. Now, it it wasn't that God wasn't there. It was I had you sure weren't paying him any attention. Void. Correct. When did it get uncontrollable for y'all? So for me. Kind of circling back to where I was with my uh, opiate prescription. Look, feel free to circle back to whatever. No, no doubt. We're not on any rigid... It transitions. Yeah. So, you know, I found manipulation in that. So I was like, well, I can easily misdiagnose myself with ADHD. So I went that route. I think that's where it got uncontrollable for me was you know, late senior year, early college, I turned into a full-blown amphetamine addict. So, not only was I taking my fair share and my friend's fair share of prescription uh, amphetamines, I was, you know, uh, balancing that out with opiates and a steady stream of marijuana. Mm -hmm. Just assume in any of my talk, alcohol is a constant. That's my baseline. That was like, that was always there. So I would start with the amphetamines, quickly take the uh, opiate, go throughout my day, 
with marijuana just in complete avoidance functional but in avoidance and then I would you know cap it off with benzos you got to land that plane yeah man I had to come down yeah uh, that's really when it all started falling apart so for me it started falling apart early um, I had some consequences but minor uh, still wasn't Honestly, I still wasn't educated on addiction, so I thought everybody was doing this, especially everybody in Starville, Mississippi in 2009. I thought we were, you know, I thought, I thought that was a normal set of circumstances because all my friends were basically doing the same thing as me. But it unraveled for me quickly. So, uh, I passed school, barely. I did pull that off, but from there, it just, you know, there's so much more I could say in a different, you know, question, but that, that's really, for me, when it all started falling apart, was during and right after college. During a minute ago, you talked about uh, ignoring those feelings. Um, and Yeah, the avoidance. Avoidance of feelings, yeah. yeah. And I think that's when everything really got dark is when once I started uh, ignoring those feelings, avoiding those feelings, and ignoring the signs from my body that, you know, you are not taking care of yourself. You know, I started having seizures. I wasn't able to sleep right. You know, and I kept, I continued to turn to drugs and alcohol which, which sounds absolutely crazy, but that's what well, Look, did. it's so hard to pick up on those things. Like, I had a therapist for a long part of my adult life who I didn't realize how awesome she was until later, but I'd go in there and I'd be like, look, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, this pissed me off so bad. And she'd be like, well, what happened the week? She talked just like that. What happened the week before? And I couldn't appreciate how important it was to see or to assess the things that happen in my life that might start me thinking or feeling something that's undesirable because it's like a ripple in water you know it may take a minute to set in you experience you have some unpleasantries with your significant other you know you have a fight with your boss you have some sort of uh, precipitating event and then a couple days later you know, it shows up, it manifests itself. Either I'm an asshole to my family or I kick the dog or, I mean, sometimes worse. Uh, it's hard to be attuned to those things and it's hard to put a practice in place to look out for them. Uh, I have, I've always thought of it kind of like the, uh, background programs on a computer. You know, like you don't realize it's running but it's kind of set you off and it's eating up your processing speed, even though you can't uh, exactly determine that it's there. I think that's an important part or uh, one of the main benefits of having like a sponsor is somebody that can kind of help you uh, see these behavior and reactionary patterns that we have that causes problems. All right, so we've hit on when it got uncontrollable for both of y'all, or got uncontrollable for both of y'all. When did you first try to get sober? Because I know both of y'all have relapsed a handful of times. I know I sure have. So let's talk about that. What made you first? What, what happened to, to get you to try to get sober? So for me, it's just my opinion. I don't con consider trying to get sober on my own in and out of relapse. Just consider that, you know, just a struggle. But so if I say that to say, I've only really relapsed once. Okay. But you know, I've tried to quit hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. So identifying when I needed to quit was when consequences started growing. We're talking about big boy shit. You know, felony charges, uh, several DUIs, uh, all kinds of misdemeanors, a lot of overnights. Look, and it's amazing how we can just be completely unaware of our lives falling down around us. You know, we're I, just not wanting to see it. Yeah, I, I call this my off ramp 
uh, theory of recovery. You know, like I can see now in retrospect how I had all these off ramps getting in trouble, getting in worse trouble, getting in way worse trouble, going to treatment centers. And I think to myself, if I had only thought, if I'd only had the presence of mind to seize the day, you know, and taken this off ramp and not gone farther down the highway of addiction and shenanigans, how better my life would be. But at the same time, I think it's important that we don't get too caught up in, gosh, only if I had blah, 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 because that's a pit. I mean, that's the that's where shame, guilt, and remorse all come from, and nothing really good can come of that. But I think it is helpful to see, you know, prospectively, this is a sort of off-ramp. I can not be, I mean, I think one of my worst problems at present is I kind of have a temper. And my kids might, I don't know if I'll ever want to have them on the podcast, they might say unpleasant things about me and my temper, but, um, or Kimberly, uh, but I think, okay, I've acted a donkey about this. Here's a good, a good example. I went bananas on my middle son, Atticus, because he stopped up the toilet. I mean, I acted a fool, hollering and screaming. I had to leave and go get a plunger. And like, I get in the car and I think to myself, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. The way you just spoke to a nine-year-old boy about stopping up the toilet. Who gave him the food? Yeah, no <laughs> shit. <clears throat> and I, so I get, you know, I get back home and I said, look, I'm so sorry. You know, daddy was wrong and all this. I'm a, you know, I get, I'm a bad parent. So I have tried to remember that, that that could be an off-ramp for me. I don't have to persist in being a temperamental asshole. I can learn from having acted a fool about the stopped up toilet. Now that you have the awareness, uh, you can succeed in that. But as far as off ramps concerned, I loved drugs and alcohol. Who didn't? I mean, that, that was the love of my life. So I had no intentions of quitting. It was still working. Oh, yeah. Look, th- they wouldn't be addictive if they didn't feel good and they didn't solve the problem they're intended to solve. I didn't need anything but that. Anything but. So, you know, consequences, and st- I could write off. Not only was my mom very involved in a local police department, which was one of my w- w- bigger downfalls, because basically went untouched in my, you know, late teens. Every time I got in trouble... I was out of it. Mm. She would beat me to the jail. Yeah. You know, they would be talking to the sheriff. Like, so I had a a law enforcement angle. That kind of minimized my consequences, but I can't repeat enough. That was my everything, drugs and alcohol. I was willing to sell my soul for it. So I could definitely overlook the, the consequences. Until they got so great that, I mean... Like a, like I died overdose. Yeah, there is a tipping point. Yeah, that's a, not to go too far forward. That's like, you know, skipping a large part of it. But that night that my brother saved my life was my biggest like, oh shit, we really got to you know start figuring what, out what's going on. What about you? Well, for me, you know, my life was completely unmanageable. And I didn't necessarily want to stop drinking and doing drugs. I just wanted things to get better. I wanted to be able to be successful and do that, you know. Uh, Exactly, Drew. Um, So it wasn't until I really had the urge to stop using um, that I finally succeeded in getting sober. Um, and the way I did that was I got a sponsor. I went to as many meetings as I could. I got a brand new phone and put only people in recovery in it. And I moved into sober living. And I stayed there for a year and a half and surrounded myself with like-minded individuals. Uh, I was not going to allow other people to drag me down, even though it was my my fault in, in the first place. I was surrounding myself with uh, 
you know, people that once I once I stopped associating with those type of people, it's it's almost like they've disappeared, and that's that's God doing for me what I could not do for myself. Yeah. What was the? Well, this kind of dovetails nicely into this. What was the turning point for you? It was maybe the OD. It was OD, but it was nothing left. Uh, not forced to, but. Uh, was experiencing so much insanity that I was basically living in a storage room with just like borderline psychosis. So I was either living in my mother's storage room after I'd lost everything, built a life for myself, you know, in Madison, which is prominent around here, and lost everything, got to the point where I was uh, living in a storage room or my truck. Um, so that was really my turning point. Unemployable came last, very last. So when I exhausted all options for employment or I couldn't even make it to work on a consistent basis, you know, then I cried for help. Then I was like, uh, this is it, so. Look, I had a law degree and right. was working for a meth head cutting trees down. And I same. mean, not just a little bit. I mean, I did it for a while. Uh, a degree. Meth and chainsaws. <laughs> <clears throat> degree. Sleep deprivation and chainsaws. You know, me and my dad were business owners. A pre, you know, pretty successful business. Um, previous marriage. Uh, you know, dogs, vehicles, what have you. You know, everything you thought you would want. And... Gave it away. Yeah, give it away. No, no, no questions no asked. No questions asked. Look, Sorry. I let drugs and alcohol take from me everything I ever worked for. Mm. Professional life, personal relationships, self-respect, everything. I mean, when I finally got, to, got sober this time, I literally didn't have enough money for a pack of Time cigarettes and a Polar Pop. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about broke down. No car, no job, no money, no nothing, except a backpack full of shenanigans. Uh, okay. How has your recovery differed this time from any previous attempts? To touch on what, you know, Johnny said was, this time I got in and got serious. Uh, got out of treatment, which is embarrassingly, embarrassingly funny, but I was the leader of the treatment facility. Like, I was scholarshiped a whole month at a, you know, I'm super grateful that I went, but I, I didn't belong. It was like thirty to fifty thousand dollar a month treatment center, so they they wanted me there. So that was my first glimpse of leadership and belonging and a healthy strive to a new life. So that transitioned into sober living, which but, is where I met you. Which is yeah, man. We had some of the greatest times. Arguably in my life. It was uh, good. It was amazing when it la while it lasted. But I got into a 12 step based program treatment center, got out. It was different because I got a sponsor. I got honest. I really had a desire to change. You know, I'd accepted the thought or I developed faith in a higher power. The, the, the thought led me, you know, I hadn't nailed it down yet, but I did come to believe that there was a chance for me. Look, I think this is the single most important thing that people in recovery need to grow and develop, and that is the belief that things can get better. Absolutely. I mean, I have seen over, I mean, I've been trying to be sober and live this life since I was like 18 years old, the first time I went to treatment, and... You know, you eventually will be completely hopeless mm. and think things can never, ever be any better. And when you think that way, you're not really willing to try to do anything because you honestly think that any effort will be completely futile. All right, what about you? What's different about your recovery this time than previous attempts to be sober? Step 12, service to others. Um, you know... My parents, uh, you know, I have 
fantastic parents that only wanted the best for me and, and wanted me to get sober. And, um, you know, the, the same conversation that I had with my mom, she told me that my dad had passed away and that uh, she had cancer. And it was a double for, whammy, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And it was, it was, a, it was a game changer for me. Um, Were you sober I, then? Uh, yes. But um, I, was, I was struggling, for sure. Um, I had a lot of mental health issues. I had uh, not really uh, searched for God again yet. Um, shortly after that, I did. And uh, after having conversations with, with family members, I look back and, and one of the things that, that my parents struggled with is not knowing how to help me. Um, they, didn't, they didn't know what resources were available. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, for people to post different resources on the site because that's really important. And that's what I'm trying to do with my life today. I'm trying to uh, help people get into treatment, whether they have insurance or not. I'm trying to help people uh, get into sober living and uh, understand that there is a way. Um, you know, sometimes we need direction and guidance. And myself and guys like you and Alex Cole and Jody and Gene and Renee and Trey and a lot of other guys that I work with at Linwood uh, have... You know, Tell everybody what Linwood is. Well, Linwood's an all-men's sober living. Uh, we have uh, multiple locations in Jackson, Flowood, and Hattiesburg. Uh, if somebody were needing possibly to get in Linwood, how would they do that? They could call me at 601-317-2664. Um, we have a website, linwoodhousesoberliving.org. Um, you couldn't they, get a shorter URL than that. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to Alex about that. Um, but yeah, we uh, we encourage uh, the guys to uh, make you know five meetings a week, get a sponsor, uh, and um, we we like for them to be an IOP. And we also offer transportation uh, to and from work, uh, meetings, uh, IOP, and. Um, other things of that nature. Well, look, since we've all talked about sober living, let's talk about sober living because sure. I am an absolute proponent of it. It saved my life. Mm-hmm. It did everything good that I needed done. It provided a safe place, some accountability. Uh, both Luke and I lived in the same Oxford house, which is similar to Linwood. Uh, Oxford house, I think, has houses all over the country, world, over, all over the world. Uh, there's plenty of websites. Uh, you can just Google it if you want to find out about it. Uh, you can text me again at 601 297 3422. I'll probably pawn you off on Shawnee over there to try to get you in the Oxford House. Uh, so let's tell people a little bit about Oxford House or Linwood or any other sober living system. Man, sober living for me was a game changer. That was the accountability I needed to get a sponsor at work still to make means. Uh, not only that, which was the minimum, it allowed me to be of service early, which uh, there's room to grow there if you've got the interest to do so. Uh, there's, you know, as you know, but some people don't, there's like a hierarchy in the process that you can go from comptroller treasurer president, you know, to the chapter level. Let's tell people a little bit about that. So I, I can speak more intelligently about Oxford House because I live there. So it's broken down into regions and then chapters. And uh, for example, I think there are four or five houses in the Jackson chapter. Six. 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 Uh, by contrast, in Baton Rouge, I think they have 30 houses or something in one chapter. Uh Anyway, when you get there, you're assigned uh, a job, uh, some sort of uh, uh, officer position like president or secretary, treasurer, and you are forced to integrate uh, and you have responsibilities. And then Oxford House has a regional employee that comes by and checks on things from time to time. 
uh, usually if things are real bad, uh, at least around here, there's a lady from Louisiana that's going to come, and if she comes, she now comes to kick man. you out. Now it's a man. Oh, I'm talking about... Uh, oh, you're talking about uh, Lori. Huh? Lori? Yeah, oh. Lori. If she came, now it was Jeremy. trouble. Jeremy. Okay. So, Oxford House is fantastic. It's relatively inexpensive. You can get a job working at, you know, nukes and make enough to pay the rent. Uh, I can't say enough good about Oxford House. I think the most important thing for me, not only was to get connected to the recovery community through Oxford House, but it was self-sustaining. So it was like, it forced you, you to learn those yeah, 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 the rice and the holes. You have to, each house is responsible for paying that house's own bills, energy, Comcast, whatever. You have to have a meeting each week account for the funds uh, there's oversight if you're screwing up or stealing they're going to kick you out and or prosecute you I mean it's, it's that was good. big for me yeah it's big for me I think it's big for everybody just learning how to uh, do the chores and the simple things like balancing a checkbook or like the comptroller does or treasurer um, it really helped in the integration back into society absolutely and it gives you enough freedom to where you're not too uh, hindered. You know, you can you can spend the night out with, within reason. Yeah, within reason. Uh, so it's good. It has been a key component to my sobriety for sure. If you get in a good one. A lot of that is also the accountability that, uh, you know, that if you... If you go out and get drunk and come home, they're going to kick you out. Yeah, you know? and, they do drug test um, Absolutely. And um, that was big for me. And also coming home uh, and if something was going on, having four, five, six, seven, whatever it was, uh, other guys that can relate to what I'm going through because they too have been going through A that. sense of community. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast was I read Johan Harry, H-A-R-I, his book, Chasing the Scream, and I cannot endorse it enough, but he talks about how, you know, he's got this really uh, clever anecdote that he tells about some guy and some rats and things like that, but the general point was that one of the contributing factors to our addiction and ongoing addiction is what can basically be a lack of community, a sense of isolation, Certainly, when you're in the throes of addiction, uh, you know all about isolation, mental, physical, relational. I mean, you withdraw unto yourself from everything. Uh, that is such, a, such an important point. But look, I wanted to talk about something else that you mentioned. You were sober, found out your mom had cancer, and your dad died, and you didn't relapse. Right. You didn't let that get you off the tracks. Because now I turned to God. Right. So talk about that. Because I think that people need to hear more stories about how I can have this unpleasant shit happen to me and I don't have to get high. Like my father has died since I've been in recovery and praise Jesus, he got to die seeing me having, you know, clean myself up. Well, it goes back to, you know, like what we were talking about earlier, avoiding those feelings, and that's what we were doing for so long. And when we avoid feelings, we don't grow. But when we actually experience those feelings, we do grow. And we are able to understand those feelings more and more. And, you know, for me, that's how I, you know, went from a boy to a man. Well, look, maybe this is better a question for a psychologist. I kind of have a love-hate relationship with the way feelings in general are treated by the recovery community. Like, I get on one one hand, it's important to be honest with yourself and, you know, you're, you know, what are you feeling today like they teach you in treatment? And I get that. And then another part of me is like, man, the hell with that. You know, it doesn't really matter what I'm feeling. Well, you just uh, got to talk about it. I, I guess. Uh, I'm still trying to suss all that out in my mind like I get that feelings are important and I also get that they're unimportant like it doesn't really matter that my feelings are hurt it doesn't really matter that I'm afraid it doesn't really matter that I'm fearful of something I've just got to stay the course and 
and maybe when I'm sober for 10 years, I'll have a better handle on that. But for now, I'm sticking with my love-hate relationship. It's acceptable. I mean, there's everybody's got weaknesses and strengths in recovery. Um, not everything comes to you all at once. I struggle with higher power. That wasn't a, you know, a constant for me when I first came in. I did have a, you know, the... I believe there's something more because uh, just like we were watching last night, the universe is, you know, unending. I'm not into the crystals and such, but there's definitely more to it than this guy. Right. So that's kind of the, you know, the route where I started on. But just watching people like you or Johnny or believing it could be done, you know, helped me power power through my weakness in that. Well, look, I, and I think the more honest we are in things like this, like on the podcast or in our personal life, and can relate to people, uh, you know, not some mask, not some facade, but like be real gut level honest about like, I'm kind of broken in this way and I'm kind of broken in that way. And so that other people can see that brokenness and sobriety can go hand in hand. It's going to happen. You know, we don't have to fix everything. No. Uh, and you can't fix everything, but you can stay sober. But how important is it, is it also to talk about uh, addict behavior in recovery? Uh, the, the sober horse thief thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you still experience, I personally, I don't know about y'all, but our recovery is not just 10 10. You know what I'm saying? I still yeah. experience. And have to counter past behavior. Right? Yeah, we have those ingrained pa- you know behaviors of pattern. I the, mean, I can work all the steps I want. I can talk to my sponsor as much as I want. I can help the next recovery addict as much as I want. I can make every meeting. But I still have some old feelings and old behaviors that try to surface. I handle them a lot differently now. But it's important, you know, for people to understand that you don't get sober... And it's a magic trick. Look, I suffered under the delusion for a long time that as long as I could pass a drug test, then somehow magically my life was going to be better. It's not real. And that I would not suffer any consequences as long as I was sober. And that's just a crock of shit. <laughs> I mean, that was, I mean, the first time I really tried to get sober, I, stayed, I was a young guy, stayed sober for four and a half years. Looking back on it, largely from the sense of community that I had built. There was a, a real tight group of us that went everywhere together and did everything together. And if y'all are listening, a couple of y'all are dead, but uh, sad. But a couple, you know, there was a group of us, and I benefited from having that sense of community. But I didn't really do anything to grow my recovery, and eventually I got high again. Uh, That's why it's important that we continue to take personal inventory. And we worked that step 12. You know, I think one thing that helped me this time is taking somebody else through the steps. And I've noticed so many different things that I didn't understand or I didn't notice when I was working them myself with my sponsor. Yeah. Well, look, a key component to any recovery is finding something good you can do with the shenanigans of your past. Mm -hmm. And when we can figure that out, well, then we've really made some important strides. All right. So I'm getting to the end of my questions. What advice would you offer to somebody newly sober? The man or woman or man that just got out of the Harbor House, what would you tell him? Hey, man, this is what you need to do. Well, first is I would try to get them to understand that they're not alone and that they don't have to be alone. That was my, you know, biggest fear coming into all this was I'm going to have to do this on my own. Uh, It was kind of a misconception because uh, not only did I get accepted into an Oxford house like late night one night on them, but everybody extended, you know, a helping hand and to, you know, put me on the right path. So... I would have to tell an addict that, or an alcoholic that they're not alone and get to a meeting as fast as you can and just 
never forget to reach out, do what they did, because millions of people stand on the shoulders of giants, as it were. There's so many uh, little cliche sayings that you know we say, in but they're good AA, though, and and we say them over and over again for a reason. You know, keep coming back. Mm. It works if you work it. Not it works if you know it. Because I thought I knew it for a long time, but it didn't work until I actually applied it to my life and got a sponsor to help me and work the steps. Then I started seeing the difference. And another thing to understand is, you know, it's okay to not be okay. Um, you know, it, for a while I thought I was doing something wrong because, you know, I didn't uh, have rainbows and butterflies surrounding me at, at times, you know, and um, once I understood that, you know, hey, I'm not alone um, and it's okay to feel what I'm feeling right now, I just got to stay the course and keep coming to meetings. Do the work. If you don't do the work, you won't uh, get the benefit. Never. I don't know how many you know tragic situations I've had to witness for people, the revolving door effect, because people don't want to do the work. That that is recovery. And one other thing for me, um, I you know I completely changed my perspective, um, and I did that with gratitude. Um, you know at first. I was uh, grateful for the socks on my feet because that's about all I had to be grateful for. Um, I've got a lot more to be grateful for today, but I'm still very grateful for the socks that I'm wearing right now. They're good socks. They huh? are good socks. What kind and, are they? Uh, I believe they're polo. I'm polo. I'm polo. I'm polo. I'm with the pads. Mm. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, it's those little things of gratitude and, and thanking God for those things. You know, one, one thing that we do at the the Linwood House meetings is uh, after we share, uh, we say five things we're grateful for. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's harder to think of five things we're grateful for. Look, but other times I've been in, <clears throat> in meetings and the topic came up of gratitude and I really wanted to just, I was so damn tired of hearing it. Because <laughs> you hear the same old tired ass platitudes blah 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 and you know look look fella I know you you're full of shit and you know, I'm not trying to hear what you got to say but now I really can see how gro gratitude is a practice as much as anything oh, else yeah. is and that's it, a recent struggle for me we've had to talk about you know it's kind of it goes back well, to it stands in stark contrast to those things that are the worst for us sense of entitlement right. is chief amongst them I should have this. Why does blah, blah, blah have something I don't have? Blah, blah, blah. And it has forced me to look back at my life and think, man, you've really been blessed. Like, you know, I had a sweet childhood, parents that loved me, that tolerated me. Uh, you know, I had you know, cars and it, advantages that... I thought were commonplace and I couldn't see that I was lucky to have them uh, and it's a practice that I think we all have to work on every day because it sure will make your life immeasurably better if you're grateful for the things you have I mean uh, there's a quote in uh, who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird uh, Harper, Harper Lee now she's got another book, um, uh, Go Set a Watchman, uh, and there's a line in there that says, uh, those who want little have much. And, you know, that's really, that's kind of spot on. Yeah. Uh, what do y'all do, practically speaking, to grow your gratitude? And I have a tip on this that I learned from somebody that's an unexpected source for such things. Well, gratitude lists are always good. Um, for me, I try to make mental gratitude lists and thank God uh, for those things. And and it's important for me to realize I wouldn't have any of that stuff without him. Um, and you know, and, and some of that is that ego uh, that that uh, you know wants to consume me as I've got these things and I did this. Um, but when I you know 
thank God for these things and yeah. realize that I wouldn't have any of it without him. Um, and that brings me back to being right sized. And if with with uh, my ego, you know, I'm either way up here and if I if I think that I did all this stuff and then when I realize that I'm not so great, I come way down and I'm depressed and same. I had a friend named Calvin who was one of those members of the tight-knit group that I was hung out with when I first got sober. Calvin has gone on to his great reward now. But those of y'all that remember Calvin, uh, he was quite a character, but he taught me this trick, and I have been better about it and worse about it at different points in my recovery. But Calvin advocated for not writing out a gratitude list, like write five things down every day you're grateful for. But Calvin... Uh, said we should write out a long gratitude list and then read it every day. Mm -hmm. And based on the proposition that repetition strengthens and affirms that we could grow our gratitude for these things by the constant reminder of them. Because if you have to do five different things every day, eventually you're going to get shit like, um, I'm grateful for the orange scented dish soap I have and things that are just unimportant. Although I do like orange scented dish soap. Sounds dish nice. Soap. Yeah. Okay. We're moving nicely to what might be my favorite part of what we're going to talk about. List some gifts y'all have gotten in recovery. We all three have gotten three hot wives yeah. since we got sober. That's right. I would have to say that my greatest achievement is a, you know, a healthy relationship and a thriving marriage. You sure wouldn't have that if you were on that dope. No, that dope is not conducive to marriage. Uh -uh. You know, fun fact. But, man, I look around now, I'm a, you know, a homeowner, homeless to homeowner, a uh, great career, um, well taken care of, employable. You got a car? Yeah, I got a truck too. Yeah. Um, dogs that take the place of children right now, who honestly are, along with my wife for my whole entire world. But I got my family back. I had a niece that was born two days ago. Congratulations and to I, your brother. Yes. And he's, that's the second one, but I've been present for the first one's whole entire life. Present. You know, and that was huge for me. I was non-existent. So I've got, you know, the I got keys to all my family's house. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That I was, feel you on that. That that just came back. Yeah. I'm talking very recent, within the last year. Uh, I've got a sense of freedom today that I've never had in my whole entire life. You know, if the it is cliche, but the chains are broken. Amen. What about you, boss? A clear conscience. Amen to that. Uh, That's you know, real. I like I like the person that I see in the mirror today, and that was not always the case. I do too. Um, I've got real friends, you know that uh, that I can depend on, and you know I know that they can depend on me. Uh, and the list is ridiculous. it's a long list. <laughs> I today. could talk for hours. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got, uh, like you said, a beautiful wife, uh, an amazing son, and another baby coming on the way. I've any got, minute now. Any, Literally any minute now. Can't wait. I've got uh, a great career, multiple jobs. Uh, people trust me. Um, people believe in me, you know. Um, I've got a house, vehicles, you know, you name it. Uh, for me, all, all that's possible. Uh, because of my relationship with God today, and I'm really grateful for that. Amen. So I should give a shout out to Kimberly for holding it down at the house for me right now with our baby so that I can be here and do this. I've also uh, got a college education. College, college education? And did you, did you have the uh, degree when you got sober? No. Mm -mm. No, I, I'd failed out like probably eight, nine times. Uh, went back to school, graduated, and halfway through grad school. Grad school. Doing big things. Doing it. Enjoying it. Look, the gifts that I can rattle off 
are pretty impressive. Uh, got married, beautiful wife. We had a baby, beautiful son. Working relationship with my other three kids. My mama lets me in her house whenever. Uh, I mean, but just, you know, I've had a job now here at this, where we are for four and a half years. Got an awesome boss. I love him. He loves me. Life is good. Life is good. And I don't think that we're special. Absolutely. This is the recipe for everybody. I mean, are there things that I wish were different about my life? Are there still some consequences I have from my shenanigans? Absolutely. Am I still confronting some of those consequences? Absolutely. But by and large, life is good. Mm. And there's no real magic to it. I mean, the universal law is that good things happen to drug addicts and alcoholics that stay sober. I mean, with just a little bit of give a shit and a little bit of effort, the God of your understanding will meet you where you are and help you out. And it's important to remember that these things don't happen overnight. You know, um, trust the process. You've just got to trust the process and not compare yourself to others. Ooh, that's uh, a big one. Because, you know, that sense I, of entitlement again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. And you just got to keep on plugging along, take it one day at a time. There's another one of those cliches we talked about, but it's true. Uh, we all say those because it's real. If some of us didn't believe that shit, we wouldn't be. You know, we're saying it, so that is, it's a valid thing to say. Absolutely. Well, fellas, I have come to the end of my list. Not that, oh, I forgot about this one. What are some goals y'all have? Life, personal, relational, spiritual. If you can rattle off a couple when we have our next podcast with you two, then we can revisit some of these things. Well, the one goal for me is to make it easier uh, for people to find treatment and find help and uh, be able to reach out to guys like me and Luke and you, Drew, and and other guys um, and girls. Because uh, I didn't I didn't know what resources were available. And didn't, Look, my I community. had been in the recovery community in Jackson from 1995 until 2017 and had zero times ever heard of Oxford House. I had no idea. I didn't even know what a sober living house was. Never heard of it. Didn't know nothing about it. So, yeah, I get it. The awareness of resources out there and how to utilize those things is important. And, you know, we've spent so much money on uh, preparing for... COVID and and dealing with that, but you know more people die from addiction every year. What are we doing for that? You know, uh, our generation has to make a difference. You know, we saw a lot of a lot of things happen uh, to uh, with Purdue Pharmaceuticals, but there's so many more avenues that need to be addressed, and uh, it's up to people like us and people like you, the listener, to make that possible. Absolutely. Without y'all's involvement, we're never going to get anything done. Well, we'll never get as much done as we can. Y'all comment, comment a lot. Tell me things you like or don't like. You don't have to be an asshole about it, but you get the point. If you've got some tips or suggestions, I mean, uh, you know, there's a couple pieces of equipment out there that I, I need. I need something called a mixer. If anybody's got an extra mixer laying around or an extra... Amplifier that goes to 11. DJ Drew. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, this has been fantastic. I love both of you. I appreciate y'all doing this. Oh, is there anything else y'all want to talk about that I didn't ask you? No, man. I mean, I guess I could, but I guess we'll save that for the next one. Well, we've, we're we about 40 seconds from hitting the hour mark, and I think people's... Uh, Patience is probably going to run thin. Yeah. Thank you for doing this, Drew. All right. Thanks for having us. Thank you.